Hello everyone, greetings from Vanderbilt and welcome to today's the Entrepreneurial Mentality webinar brought to you by your Vanderbilt Alumni Association. I'm Drew Webb, Assistant Director of Student Alumni Engagement and I'm so glad you could join us this afternoon. This webinar is just one resource of many that Vanderbilt provides to our alumni, so be sure to familiarize yourself with some of the additional services that we offer at buconnect.com slash career. Today's webinar will last around 20 minutes with plenty of time um, at the end for questions, so please feel free to type in questions uh, into the question box on the side panel of your screen throughout the presentation and after, and we will make sure that all of these get addressed. Um, our presenter today, Avi Spillman, is a serial entrepreneur specializing in emerging markets such as online gaming, green chemicals, and innovative technologies. Currently, Avi is the founder and president of June Properties, a Nashville boutique real estate development company. He is also an active angel investor and startup advisor. Avi is the author of the award-winning white paper, Blockchain, Digitally Re Rebuilding the Real Estate Industry. He holds a Bachelor's of Art in Philosophy from Vanderbilt and a Master's of Science in Real Estate Development from MIT. Avi, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Drew, for the warm introduction and to you and the Vanderbilt Alumni Association for inviting me to present. Uh, I generally prefer an informal discussion format for my courses and presentations, but alas, that is difficult with the webinar. So I've done my best to apply that framework here. That being said, the slides will be inspirational at best, so feel free to follow along or just sit back, relax, and enjoy the one-sided conversation. I think it is pertinent to share that I started my first business while attending Vandy. It was an online gaming site. I think it was during this time when my friends were all attending job interviews and I was interviewing developers in Pakistan that I realized our life journeys were about to divert in a dramatic way. Some people call that an aha moment. I prefer to call it an uh uh moment. And we can talk more about that at the end. There's a lot that can be drawn from this, in, from this image. For instance, at least five people in this image are entrepreneurs. And at least four of them have been successful at it today. More importantly, it illustrates that there is no planned path for an entrepreneur. I'm 31. I've started and or built five companies in industries completely unrelated to each other. And I still have no idea what I want to do when I grow up. Since the previous presentations had an agenda, I figured I would include one as well for your viewing pleasure. We'll start off with an intro, setting the stage of what we're going to discuss and why we're going to discuss it. Then we'll put together some goals, what we hope to gain from this presentation, review concepts that can be applied to our personal situations and reflected upon, and then insert hacks you know, that's a term that us millennials like to use when referring to skills and applicable lessons. Finally, there is going to be some homework. This talk would have no value if I did not leave you with a few executable tips to help you get moving. This, this part is on your time and is optional because homework should always be optional, I think. So it's always good to start with defining what we're talking about, right? In this case, according to Google, Entrepreneurship is the activity of setting up a business or businesses. It is taking on financial risks in the hope of profit. This may be surprising since the current perception of entrepreneurship is millennials wearing plaid shirts over Henleys while working out of a coffee shop on a Mac computer with headphones blasting electronic dance music. That's because being an entrepreneur is totally awesome. You know, shouldn't you be one? Perchance you have super duper idea that you've been carrying around for the last five years. One of those, wouldn't it be great if, or why don't they invent a dot, dot, dot. Maybe you feel uninspired at work. Don't like the idea of clocking in and out. Or perhaps being an, op being an entrepreneur just seems super sexy. You know, like Evan Spiegel. You'll found a company that IPOs for billions of dollars, get engaged to a Victoria's Secret supermodel, turn 26 years old, talk on the tech circuit, go to the Grammys, win some awards, get featured on magazine covers, and more magazine covers. It looks great. It looks pr pretty awesome. Why wouldn't you want to do that? But the reality is that being an entrepreneur is hard. It is really, really hard, and people don't talk about it. It takes a lot of time and a tremendous amount of effort and perseverance. 
the media only shows us the successes, but none of the numerous failures that undoubtedly came before. Don't believe me? Just ask Mark Cuban. It takes more than a great idea, more than a desire to be different, and definitely more than a cool beard, aviators, and an Airbnb at South by Southwest. It is mentally, physically, and emotionally taxing to be an entrepreneur. It is this part of the entrepreneurial process that we're going to focus on today. And if you have any desire or dreams of being an entrepreneur, enough at least that you tuned in for this presentation, then you're in the right place because we're going to prepare you to take that first step. But first, we need to address the elephant in the room. Can you teach entrepreneurship? Well, historically, most people say, no, of course not. People who are entrepreneurs are just born that way. They are different. They are creative. Maybe they are genius, but they are definitely risk takers. They have a spirit about them, or what I like to call a type E personality. And of course, there are those who say, absolutely, which is essentially entrepreneur talk for saying, probably. They believe that entrepreneurship is a craft, and those who, who teach entrepreneurship believe that it lays somewhere between a science, which is precise, and an art, which is abstract. So then the question is whether or not it can be taught, and this depends on whether a body of work can be developed around it. And if you teach this body of work, does it increase the likelihood for success? So far, there is research that's come out that indicates that, yes, in fact, entrepreneurship can be taught. Because the more times a person is an entrepreneur, the higher the odds become of success. In the case of Evan Spiegel, Snapchat was not his first endeavor, although he did pretty well in a short amount of time. Finally, especially in this case, but maybe for anyone who's been to Vandy in general, what does it mean to teach? Well, with entrepreneurship, the most effective method seems to be a combination of principles and experience. Personally, I think the answer is somewhere in between. Yes, you can always improve your likelihood of success, or in other words, reduce the risk by learning important skills and principles. But you'll need to find that drive as well, and for no other reason than to finally have the courage to take that first step and then keep on going. A big part of what prevents people from making the leap into entrepreneurship is the fear of the unknown. We're going to add form to the unknown in order to make, it, make that first step a little bit less scary. It's hard to leave the comforts of everyday normal life, a stable paycheck, date night, fantasy football Sundays, routine and structure. Entrepreneurs call these comforts, hopefully you can hear me doing air quotes, comforts by another word, complacency. I think of complacency as a habit. And as we know, habits are hard to break. But let's give it a try anyway. The first concept we will explore is the entrepreneurial phenotype. They are what I have coined type E personalities. Type E personalities are insatiable learners, explorers. They are constantly trying to disrupt an industry or apply new concepts to an old problem. They are possibly categorized as being naively irreverent toward the world with a certain kind of charismatic energy about them. In my journey, I've chronicled this personality type extensively. What I've discovered is that it can be found in every indus industry, not just tech, and it's non-discriminatory. Anyone can be an entrepreneur at any time. Since becoming an entrepreneur requires spirit, determination, and a desire to learn, there is no mold. Age is not a factor. Gender is not a factor. Race, religion, sexual orientation, political beliefs, Kardashian fan or not, the only limits to becoming an entrepreneur are the ones we set on ourselves. I'll say this, no matter who you are, if you want to be an entrepreneur, the struggles will be just as difficult, the failures will hurt just as much, 
and the successes will be just as sweet. Now that we're motivated, let's come back down to reality. The entrepreneurial path is a lonely one. A French entrepreneur of mine once said, as an entrepreneur, the ratio of hearing yes to no is one to 1,000. That's a lot of rejection, and people love rejection. Am I right? Am I right? I know you can't answer, but why not? I know when my buddy and I were bootstrapping that first business at Vandy, my friends could not understand, nor did they really care to, what I was doing, nor why I was doing it. After school, they moved into their fancy apartments in New York City with their high-paying jobs at Bear Stern and Lehman Brothers. Well, I moved back home. I should mention that I graduated Vandy in May 2008. Sold my company in July 2008. And as for my friends, well, let's just say the economy was not too kind to our graduating class. This also brings us to our first hack. Find your community. The best way to get motivated and stay motivated is to surround yourself with other entrepreneurs. Not only will you feed off of each other's energy and learn from each other's experiences, but other entrepreneurs will be the best support group. There is an important caveat to this nugget of intelligence here. Make sure you surround yourself with better, smarter entrepreneurs. This will push you to do better. Avoid entrepreneurs at all costs. These are people pretending to be entrepreneurs. They suffer from complacency under the guise of entrepreneurship. True fellow entrepreneurs will elevate you. Entrepreneurs will anchor you down. Since entrepreneurs come in all shapes, sizes, and smells, it should not be surprising that every path is different, and everyone's role in that path is different. In the beginning, you may need to do everything yourself, and that's okay. But every idea, for every idea person, there is a person who knows how to execute, and vice versa. Being an entrepreneur requires an in-depth understanding of oneself. Only when you know your strengths and weaknesses can you understand your limitations neither improve upon them or find a compliment to take them over. Self-awareness and discipline are vital components to surviving the entrepreneurial journey. The purpose of self-awareness extends beyond just knowing limitations, but provides us with information necessary to develop a strategy for success. We must look at ourselves through the same lens as our business. As an entrepreneur, our business is a reflection of ourselves, and we, and we must be performing an optimal condition for our business to be doing the same. That is partially why physical and mental health have become so important to the entrepreneurial lifestyle. This is also why entrepreneurs speak in questions, not answers. We are constantly trying to analyze, understand, interpret, and apply. So how do we make sure we are at our best? Time for hack number two. Ask for help. Crazy, I know. But if I had one piece of advice, one takeaway from this talk for everyone out there in the internet, regardless of whether or not you care to be an entrepreneur, it would be this. Find yourself a mentor. Mentors are the most valuable asset an entrepreneur can have. Find yourself three mentors if you can. Now comes the hack of hacks, an insider secret. After you found your awesome mentors, become a mentor. Giving back is great. I'm all for volunteering time and expertise, hence this webinar. But I think you'll find that through the process of helping others, you'll find solutions to your own problems. Most of us have the answers we need floating around somewhere in our minds. But it's always easier to fish them out when applying them to someone else's situation. Plus, it is the right thing to do. Someone helps you along the way, the most valuable gift you can give is to pay that generosity forward. Now, I do want to leave significant time for questions and answers. Since we could have gone in a number of different directions with this talk, I do ask that we try to stay on topic of the entrepreneurial experience. But first, homework. Bill Allett, the director of the Trust Center for Entrepreneurship at MIT, says entrepreneurship is not about having a great idea. It's about execution. An entrepreneur must be able to execute, commercialize an idea with the intensity of a Navy SEAL. The way I like to think of it is, no one can be an entrepreneur for you. It requires action. 
So first things first, get inspired. Find a community. Join a co-working space. Go to meetups, online forums, Slack. There are a number of ways for you to find the people who are going to inspire you and, and also uh, push you to do the things that you've always wanted to do. Read. Read as much as you can. You know, starting with some books like Napoleon Hill, anything by Napoleon Hill, but Think and Grow Rich, Tim Ferriss, The 4-Hour Workweek, anything by Jim Fox. There are a number of great entrepreneurial books out there. Read articles, blogs, podcasts, whatever it is. And then follow your favorite inspirational entrepreneurs. With Twitter, Instagram, there are so many ways now to get inspired. You know, I, I would recommend starting with people like Elon Musk, Gary Vaynerchuk, Seth Godin, you know, whoever it is that really lights that fire for you. Next is find a passion, something you really care about. It could be an idea, an industry, a cause, but if you're passionate about, about it, you'll do it well and you'll care to do it well. Last but not least, take action. It could be a small step or a dramatic change. Just go take that first step today. You'll probably fail, but that's okay. Get up, do it again. The next time won't be any easier, but you'll be better prepared. Trust me. I believe in you, and thanks. Good luck. That's all I got. That's all I got for you. <laughs> hey, Avi, well, thank you so much for that. Um... Attendees, please feel free to go on ahead and type in your questions, and we'll facilitate a Q&A here. We've already had one come in, Avi. Um, what made you interested in entrepreneurship, and when did you realize it? It's a great, great question. Um, you know, I think that what I was alluding to earlier about the difference between an aha moment and an uh-uh moment. Um, you know, aha moments are, tend to be cat categorized as inspirational epiphanies. Um, for me, I think it was more of a uh, checklist of things that I was crossing off. I think part of it is I realized that uh, I did not fit into your typical sort of nine to five manager boss situation. So early on, I realized that like a regular typical job was just not going to be for me. So it's not so much that I was like inspired to be an entrepreneur as I knew that the other alternative just really didn't work. Uh, for the type of person that I am. I also always tr believe I give 115% into everything that I do. Uh, and so I feel, and I'm sure people out there um, also have the same feeling that it's frustrating sometimes to be able to be putting in all this work and energy uh, for something where you might feel that somebody, your manager, your manager's manager, you know, why are they benefiting from all my hard work? Um, where if, if I'm going to work this hard, then really the person who should benefit from it is me. And so that's sort of how I realized that I wanted to first be an entrepreneur. Okay, great. Um, do you have any advice on accounting or bookkeeping for an entrepreneur? Uh, definitely. Um, I mean, I think that in some ways an entrepreneur, especially if you're starting off on your own, needs to be somewhat of a jack of all trades. Um, but I think another one of the uh, sort of secrets of entrepreneurship is uh, you can always hire the things that you're not good at, right? And so for me, like accounting is not my area of expertise by any means. Uh, it just so happens in uh, one of my current ventures, I need to dive in deeply and become an expert in some accounting um, because I believe that the way that my company is currently operating is not the most efficient method. So the best way for me to know how to fix that is to learn it myself. But you can always find uh, a third party company or hire somebody who's good with numbers um, who can handle those things for you. You know, there's a lot of uh, available resources today that were never available before. Um, I have friends and know of companies who are themselves, um, you know, accountants or CPAs or CFOs for startups where they, they themselves, their job is to be a CFO for five different startups. And that's the one role they play and they do it really well. And so they sort of contract out those expertise. Um, the basics of accounting, you could probably figure out in the beginning on your own. You can take an online course. If you're at Vandy, you can take a Vandy course or a continuing education course to learn, to learn the sort of the 101s. 
But if you're doing well and your business continues to grow, hire talented, smart people to do those things for you. Okay, great. Um, how important is a business plan with your idea? With my idea? I don't know if I sum up Or that. with an idea, I guess. Oh, with an idea. Okay. Uh, look, business plans are important. You know, I think that, um, you know, I, I don't put a huge amount of weight into it, um, but that's because I think part of it is where I am in my entrepreneurial journey. Um, you know, business plans are good for people who don't necessarily have a network yet for what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, in which case they need to be very clear and succinct about what they're trying to pitch, what they're trying to explain. Um, I do say that part of why we started creating some curriculum uh, around this topic of the entrepreneurial mentality is because the focus is very often on creating pitch decks and sales pitches and pro formas, which are definitely important and critical pieces. Um, you know, but not enough about, you know, well, once I've done that, you know, how do I actually take that and, and turn that into a, a business that is succeeding? Um, so, yeah, I mean, you definitely need to do a pitch deck, and you want it to be clear and concise. You want it to be entertaining. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's, it's people who are selling a product or a business idea. And smart investors don't invest in companies. They invest in people, they invest in teams, they invest in leadership. So pitch deck is good because visuals always help in terms of representing what it is you may be trying to accomplish. Um, but don't put all of your weight into your pitch deck because ultimately it's about you and yourself that people are going to invest in. So put some time into that as well. Okay, here's another one. Uh, you mentioned finding communities to be part of. Um, are there any specific online communities, forums, Slack, et cetera, that you recommend? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily know if there, I'm sure there are for entrepreneurs. You know, I think some of these uh, authors who, you know, are in that space, like Seth Godin, have their own entrepreneur, like, uh, like uh, networks that you could uh, participate in. Um, I think the first starting place could be a, uh, a passion. You know, for example, um, I'm currently in the research uh, and education space for blockchain. Um, and so there's a great blockchain Slack that I joined. There's a blockchain meetup in Nashville that I go to. Uh, you know, there are uh, a community of networks um, and conferences that you could start with. Um, so there is no right starting space. And, if you, and I'm sure there's some for generalizations of entrepreneurship if you want that to take that first step. Um, but I'd start with, with a passion first and then find other people who are passionate about that idea or industry or topic. Great. Um, and Avi, you mentioned a little bit about mentoring. Can you talk a little bit about the process of how you ask someone to be your mentor or how you um, decide to be a mentee? That, that is a great question. That's a fantastic question. Um, you know, people often do not want to uh, part with money. <laughs> or people don't like to be asked for money directly. Um, but what people are always willing to give is, is time, right? And their story. You know, for the most part, people love to talk about themselves. Um, but in some ways, that, that's, that is a good thing. I think mentors come in all shapes and sizes and you're going to want to rotate your mentors your mentors depending on where you are and where your business is in, in your growth. Um, personally, I uh, developed what I call a, a board of trustees for my life, right? And on that board of trustees, I have three seats that somewhat rotate as, as I've gotten older. Uh, three of those seats are for people who are mentors for, for me, for Avi. Uh, for my own personal and professional growth. Um, and then uh, the other two seats are mentors for my specific businesses, right, who have expertise or experience in the industry that I'm currently working in. Um, generally, the best way to do it is just to be very upfront about what you're looking for. Hi, my name is Avi Spielman. You know, I see that you are, whatever our connection is, I see you are a Vanderbilt alumni. You have expertise in entrepreneurship. You know, I want to be an entrepreneur and I would love 15 minutes of your time to just ask you a few questions and learn about your experience. 
And that's it. That's really what you're trying to do. You're trying to learn from their experience. And people are very forthcoming with, with that type of uh, information. And then as you build that relationship over time, I think you'll find that generally your mentors will be your, not only your biggest fans, but they'll probably be your first investors, right? If you're starting a business in um, blockchain, and I'm sorry for those of you who don't know what blockchain out there, it's just it's the first thing that popped into my mind. But if you're starting a blockchain-based business and you find two mentors who have experience in blockchain and you learn from their experience and you share with them your ideas, they themselves will tell you whether or not it's a good idea. And if it is a good idea, or if they've helped you take a bad idea and turn it into a good idea, you know, odds are they'll probably want to invest in you. But I think the biggest part about being an entrepreneur is, is this idea that you need to be able to build relationships. But that doesn't mean that if you're not an extrovert or a, a relationship builder that you can't be an entrepreneur. You know, that's the part about finding your complement. Now, personally, I am naturally an introverted person, and this tends to shock my, my family and friends, but all of those tests that you can take that determine your type of personality, I, I, my results always come out the same. I am an introvert. Uh, I have taught myself through necessity how to be extroverted. Um, as a result, I find it to be incredibly draining and exhausting, but I can do it. Um, I have uh, other friends. Uh, I'll give a little shout out here. Uh, two buddies from Vanderbilt, they're both Vanderbilt alumni, uh, Brett Boscoff and Ben Hidmond, who as far as personality goes, one of them is an outgoing, jumping off the walls, high energy extrovert, and the other one is a brilliant, they're, they're both brilliant, but the other one is more of an introverted coder, um, you know, back end. And together as partners, They've been able to build uh, an amazingly incredible business called Splash, and it's because they realized that they're not just their skill sets, but their personalities complemented each other, and the sums of the two parts individually uh, were greater when you put them together. Great. Um, for those of us who have motivation and drive but are lacking in the creative department, where can we look to begin finding and generating ideas? Okay, I'm going to try to interpret that question. If I'm wrong, Drew, can they type it back in? And, yeah, and absolutely. Clarify? Okay, I, I, it, the way I'm interpreting that question is I'm a great executioner, I'm a hard worker, you know, but I haven't had my aha inspirational idea. Um, and so my right. advice in that case, if that is actually the question, is take the same path that I laid out here in this presentation. Still surround yourself with entrepreneurs, you know, put your, get inspired. You know, you may not be so inspired, but if you start by finding other entrepreneurs, you'll find that person who has a good idea. And that, that will be your partner. I think the other part of that that's important is um, that I, I, I touched upon, I don't know if I hammered it home in the presentation, is, you know, don't expect your first venture to be successful. 99, really 100%, it will fail. But that's okay. And I think part of why I bring that back is because it's okay if you don't know what your inspiration or good idea or great idea is yet. But if you go and just start and join a startup or start a business that maybe is not so inspiring to you or not a great idea, to get that experience of building your own business, well, odds are that the inspirational will come at some point. And by then, you'll be ready because you've already started or helped build or be a part of startups uh, before. All right, here's another one. Um, is there a particular moment you can think of where you thought that you might want to go back into a regular nine to five job? Um, and if so, what did you do to get back into the entrepreneurial uh, mentality? <laughs> it's a good question as well. Um, Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I, I've had opportunities to come into startups and help build them um, at a at a what they call a C-suite level, right? At a managerial, managing director level, partner level. And even when I've come into an existing business, um, I, I still come into it in an entrepreneurial mentality. I still look at it and the way that I live and operate my business life and my professional life as an entrepreneur. And I think part of that is being able to 
uh, create realistic and transparent expectations about how I and this business should operate. Um, you know, did, have I been lured by the appeal of some large companies who claim to have an entrepreneurial ecosystem within them? Uh, definitely. Um, but immediately, even through the interview process, I realized that um, it just, it's just not a good fit for me. It just doesn't really work out. Okay, Avi, do you need to know how to get customers before you start a business? No. You need to know how to make money before you start a business. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, customer acquisition is definitely, definitely an important part of any business that's growing out. And may, some may argue that that is the most important part. But really, you need to know how is your business going to generate revenue? Um, how are you going to make money? And what, are, what is the potential uh, and the cap of your current revenue stream? Um, and do you need, so is, is there a limit to how big this business can be? Um, those are some of the questions that I would start with. Okay, Avi, can you talk, um, talk about raising capital initially? Um, was it going to family and friends and then VCs or other entrepreneurs? Uh, what was the lifestyle like during that period? So this is, this is an interesting question because my experience, I think, is not what is sort of commonplace today. Um, in my experience, I first went to friends and family, and that was, you know, often when they say a good thing to do. For me, that was a mistake um, because my friends and family are, excuse me, my harshest critics, which is in the grand scheme a, a good thing, um, you know, but at the same time, you know, they didn't really take me very seriously, <laughs> which, is, which is okay. Um, because it definitely hardened me to be better when I went out there to, to raise capital. Um, most of my businesses have been bootstrapped. Um, and what that means is, you know, I've essentially, through my own funds, um, started those businesses and built those businesses. Very lean. It, it's a misconception that you need to have money to start a business or build a business. Really, you need money usually to grow a business. But you could start a business for very little. You know, the, the only value, really, the, the, the cost of starting a business is your time and your energy and your efforts. You know, and you could find people similar to yourself who are similarly dedicated to idea, willing to invest their time and energy and efforts. So in the beginning, I, I generally think you don't need a lot of money to get started. You know, you just need the drive and will to do it. Um, that opens up another debate that we can talk to later about can you be a part-time entrepreneur. Um, but I'm going to table that for now unless someone brings it up again. Um, and, but the way that that kind of differs from what's going on today is for the, it's, it's actually starting to slow down a lot now. But for the last two plus years, you know, we've seen a huge influx of capital where people were just throwing VCs, private equity, just throwing money around. Um, and so it was really easy for really big companies to get huge and for some uh, smaller companies to get seed capital. Um, and so all you had, so that was a different approach than I'm used to. Like all you had to do was have an idea and suddenly you can raise like a $2 million seed round without any product, without any revenue, without anything. And to me, that was, that was kind of mind blowing. You know, the entrepreneurial uh, landscape has changed a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, Drew, you know, you and I were joking earlier that when someone said they were an entrepreneur, that used to mean, oh, um, I'm unemployed. <laughs> that, that's just another word for saying unemployed. Today, there are more structured pathways for entrepreneurs. There are accelerator programs. There are incubators. There are prizes and, and competitions. You know, nowadays I hear more about people saying, you know, come up with an idea, pitch it at a competition, you know, get into an accelerator, you know, and by then you already have credibility because you've done all these things. And you probably have, if you won the competition, maybe you got some money. If you're in the accelerator, maybe they give you some funding. You know, so suddenly you already have money, you have mentors, you have support uh, without even having a product necessarily or without having any revenue. 
And to me, that's just, that's just mind boggling, but that's kind of the reality of, of today's entrepreneurial landscape. Is an MBA helpful to become an entrepreneur? Uh, that is a question um, as old as time, um, or at least as old as MBA programs. <laughs> um, my, my initial reaction was always no, definitely not, you know, because the best education for anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur is going out there and being an entrepreneur. You know, no one can teach you how to do that. You, you just have to go out there, experience it, and learn it for yourself. Now, that being said, today's, there are programs out there, Stanford, uh, MIT Sloan, um, even Vanderbilt is, is, is uh, you know, shifting their gears, because Vanderbilt is a fantastic MBA program, um, where they are trying to uh, focus on entrepreneurship, create curriculum on entrepreneurship, um, provide opportunities and you know the same things we spoke about for startups uh, but do it through the guise of, uh, of an MBA program with accelerators and incubators and awards and competitions um, so it, it is a bit different out there today um, I mentioned Bill Owlett the reason why I don't mind bringing up Bill Owlett is because his son Tommy was my roommate at Vanderbilt um, so he's a little Vanderbilt love there um, and you know Bill Owlett he's he, He's doing it himself. He's creating an unbelievable uh, curriculum for people who want to be entrepreneurs and have access to that kind of information. Um, what's, what's interesting and fascinating about that is, uh, you know, it's not just for people who are getting MBAs, though. That type of information is being prepared for alumni uh, and for uh, seasoned executives and for anyone who thinks that they might want to, at any point, start, start those businesses. Um, but that being said, I don't think an MBA by any means is critical to getting uh, to becoming an entrepreneur by no means at all it can be helpful if you are selective about the MBA program that you go to um, but MBA programs are very much and this is just my opinion it's not a fact um, whether you agree with me or not but in some ways they are choose your own adventure you know the difficult part about MBA programs or any graduate program uh, is um, you know is you you get out of it what you put into it and so, you know, the hard part is generally getting in. And then a lot of people there are just trying to change industry, change jobs. So to, to the idea of finding your community, you know, I don't know if going into an MBA or graduate program uh, will suddenly allow you to find a community of like-minded people who want to be entrepreneurs. So I think that's something to keep in mind. There are also... Um, you know, entrepreneurship or any industry-specific master's programs that are being developed and are, are coming out. Uh, for me, I decided not to get an MBA. Instead, I got a master's in a very specific space. Uh, and it was an eye-opening experience that was absolutely fantastic. A lot of that has to do with the institution that I was at, I think. Um, but so I am no longer anti-graduate uh, degree work for people who want to be entrepreneurs, um, but I don't think it's necessary. Okay, it looks like we have three more that came in, and then we'll wrap up. And I love this one that came in. Um, if you could change something from your time at Vanderbilt, knowing what you do now about entrepreneurship, what would you do differently? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, uh, that's a good I probably would have taken an accounting course. <laughs> I didn't take any accounting. I didn't really take much finance. Um, but... Um, you know, I think if I knew really that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, um, I would have probably been better about selecting the courses that I took. You know, I also think it's a fallacy uh, in school that you need to, like, only you have to start with intro level or undergraduate courses. I probably would have sat in on an MBA course or two uh, at Owen, um, and that definitely I think would have been interesting. Maybe I also would have taken some sort of engineering course. Um, um, but I think I would have probably been more selective about my, my course, my coursework. It's probably what I've done differently. Great. Um, what sources do you read or use to inspire disruptive ideas? For example, applying blockchain to real estate. Did you start with a deep dive into blockchain and then find applications? So, a good question. Um, I'm going to answer that in, in two parts. Um, I think the first part of that question is, uh, for me, my inspiration generally comes from my, my network. 
Um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be in, in a, a variety of entrepreneurially, entrepreneurially, you try saying entrepreneur like 10 times in the presentation. <laughs> uh, entrepreneurially um, uh, um, um, saturated environments. And that's afforded me the luxury of being able to find some really inspirational people who I can now call friends. And they, they're the ones who, are, who usually send me my inspiration. Um, the blockchain and real estate was, was a um, kind of like this perfect storm of opportunity. Uh, I was uh, um, helping a friend who is also a Vanderbilt alum, uh, Lisa Carve Carvelis, uh, Carveas, as I call her. Uh, and Lisa has uh, put together uh, an event at her beautiful um, estate where she does events. And uh, so I helped to curate some of that content. And one of the panels that I curated was this blockchain panel on can blockchain end poverty in the world. And it just so happened that one of the people who we were talking about to be a panelist, a gentleman named Brian Ford, um, uh, matriculated to MIT around the same time that I did. And my master's at MIT was in real estate and development. Um, and while I was there, they started the digital currency initiative. And part of that initiative was a working group with the brilliant Simon Johnson, professor of economics at Sloan. And everyone was talking about all these applications for blockchain. And I said, well, is anyone talking about real estate? And the answer was no. Or the answer was more of, yes, you are. Congratulations. Um, and so that was sort of how I got into that intersection. And I wrote my thesis on it. And um, people actually read it, which boggles my mind. Um, but it has been um, an incredible, it's afforded me an unsuspected um, journey of, of that's been uh, incredibly rewarding. So that's kind of how I got into real estate blockchain. Great. And last one, uh, where is a good entrepreneurial co-working space in Nashville? Okay, so um, I think the, the EC is the first place you have to go. That's the Entrepreneurship Center. It's on Peabody Drive, Peabody Way. Um, besides the fact that there's a delicious little munchinette called the Moscow's in it, um, the EC is definitely like was the first place where Nashville started to put their flag down and say, we want to be a hub in the Southeast for entrepreneurship. And I think Nashville is a very exciting place to be an entrepreneur right now. Um, and uh, there are some other co-working spaces. I, I cannot for the life of me remember the names off the top of my head. Uh, but there are a few of these pay for uh, WeWork style co-working spaces that have opened up in Nashville that you can definitely uh, be involved in. But don't forget, don't forget my warning, right? Uh, it's if you want to pay for a desk to be in a co-working space, you know, you want to make sure that the other people who are there uh, are actually entrepreneurs who are working on real projects who are going to inspire you and support you. Um, not just people who wanted to not work in an office or work out of home and would rather work in a, in a co-working space than home. Right? So you, even within the co-working space community, there are, those, there are spaces with real people who are trying to do real things and spaces with people who just want to kind of uh, emulate the lifestyle. Great. Well, well, work, awesome. Going back and working at Vandy is also an option. Um, you know, Absolutely. We have campus. space in our Wondery on campus, um, and would, I'm sure they would love to see any of you all come in and tour the space um, and meet them. Abs absolutely. Uh, Bobby, thank you so much for the insightful presentation. Attendees, thank you all for, your, for logging in today and for your um, great questions. Um, just as an FYI, we did record the presentation today, so I'll be sending out um, a link uh, to a YouTube um, uh, video so you can watch this later and reference it. And I'll also um, send out a link to a short evaluation and we'd love to hear your feedback on the presentation today. But uh, thank you all again for joining and have a great rest of your afternoon.